All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today we're gonna talk about ecosystem recycling. Um, make sure that you have your notes open on a separate tab and you can pause me at any time because I'm gonna try to talk really fast to keep this under 10 minutes. Um, let me know if you have any questions. All right, so what are we talking about with this recycling business? We're talking specifically about something called biogeochemical cycles. Bio means life, geo means earth. So we're talking about chemicals that are traveling through the biotic and abiotic parts of the planet. There are many different kinds of biogeochemical cycles. I'm gonna tell you about four of them today. Um, the diagram below is not one of the ones I will be testing you on. I just wanted you to see that there is such a thing as a mercury cycle. Um, but what we're gonna be talking about are different cycles. We're gonna talk first First of all, about the water cycle. And I'm guessing that you had water cycle when you were in elementary school, so most of this is familiar. But I am going to teach you a new word today, and the word is transpiration. And it turns out it's a super important part of the water cycle that often gets ignored in junior high or in elementary school science classrooms. Transpiration refers to the release or evaporation of water from plant leaves. And it turns out that it releases, plants release an enormous amount of water into the atmosphere, particularly when you're in an area that is forested or in a farmland. The humidity skyrockets. It turns out that the tropical rainforests it's this fabulous cycle. It rains a lot, so lots of trees and plants can grow, but then they transpire so much water into the air that the humidity skyrockets, clouds form, and it rains again. And so it's this fabulous cycle that keeps feeding itself. Unfortunately, cutting down the rainforest actually changes weather patterns. There's not as much transpiration, there's not as much water vapor, and so, um, so the weather patterns themselves can change. All right, and that's all we're gonna talk about with the water cycle. I think you know the rest of it. And conveniently, we've also talked a little bit about the carbon cycle before, but I'm gonna add one more thing to the carbon cycle. So just a quick refresher, we've talked about photosynthesis and that photosynthesis is what's happening in plants when they pull in the carbon dioxide. Remember, plants are hungry for carbon dioxide and they are on our team when it comes to global warming. They're the greatest asset for pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, in, res or in the opposite part of that reaction, um, cell respiration is what we do. Plants do cell respiration also, don't forget, but we only do cell respiration. Cell respiration is when we're making our ATP and as a toxic byproduct, we release a little bit of carbon dioxide. Um, so that's part of the carbon cycle, this um, constant release of carbon dioxide and then taking it in by plants. But there's a really important part of the carbon cycle we haven't talked about yet, and that part of the carbon cycle is called combustion. Combustion happens in a volcano, it happens naturally in a forest fire, but it also happens unnaturally when we're burning things for, um, for our cars or for factories or what have you. So the currently, the carbon cycle on our planet is extremely out of balance. Um, there's too much carbon being released by factories um, in emissions, and we refer to that as combustion. Anytime you burn anything, light a match, that's combustion, and combustion releases carbon dioxide into the air. Plants are the very things that could pull that combustion out. Uh, combustion out, they could pull the carbon dioxide out. And unfortunately, so many trees have been cut down or burned away that the very things that would be pulling that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, we're low on right now. We need more plants to clean up the carbon dioxide for us. All right, and just a few more things about sort of what's been happening with carbon dioxide in our recent history. In the last 150 years, carbon dioxide levels have increased by about 40%. And in just the last 40 years, our carbon dioxide levels have increased 20%. Um, if you take a look at the graph, I think it's interesting, the red line in particular, that red line refers to China. Um, the blue line is the United States. We've been a massive carbon dioxide emitter for, for several decades now. Um, China within the last decade or so has surpassed us as they develop develop, um, they're releasing more and more carbon dioxide. So we're re really the world leaders when it comes, in a bad way, when it comes to carbon dioxide emissions. So what is going on with carbon dioxide exactly? Plants and animals, dead or alive, contain carbon. We are called carbon-based life forms. You may have heard that in a science fiction movie or something. Fossil fuels are made from the remains of dead plants and animals. So whether you're talking coal or oil or natural gas, they all are full of carbon because they came from ancient animals that passed away. Then when we burn those fossil fuels, we're taking the carbon that was in those dead animals or plants and releasing it back into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So that's where this combustion problem with our carbon dioxide cycle. 
And unfortunately, in many areas of the world or in areas of the world that have tropical rainforests, many of the local people are burning the rainforests in order to build farmland. Totally sensible, totally understand. They need to feed their families. Unfortunately, burning the rainforest is sort of a double whammy. Anytime, remember that match, anytime we light anything um, on fire where it's combustion and it's releasing carbon dioxide into the air. So burning the rainforest releases carbon dioxide into the air. And the very thing that could be pulling the carbon dioxide out for us, we just burned up, it's gone. Um, so as the tropical rainforests go away, not only are they important, remember we talked about them in the water cycle, but here they are super important in the carbon dioxide cycle, the carbon cycle also. All right, and then just a couple interesting photos. These are photos that were taken by the space shuttle. Um, this is a photograph of South America during the, what's called the non-burning season when um, people are not burning the rainforests and you have normal puffy water vapor clouds. This is the same photo taken from um, the space shuttle during what's called the burn season. Most of the continent of South America is covered with sort of a yellow smoke. It really becomes pretty shocking when you see it from outer space. All right, we're going to talk about our next cycle. We've got two cycles left, the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. Nitrogen makes up 78% of our atmosphere. We often think that our the air that we're breathing in is oxygen, but really only about 21% of the air that we breathe in is oxygen. Ton of that um, air that we're breathing in is nitrogen, and our bodies have no way of removing the nitrogen from the air. So we just exhale that nitrogen right back out. Unfortunately, we need that nitrogen for really, really important things like, oh, I don't know, DNA and proteins. Um, and so we've got to have a way to get a hold of that nitrogen. And we are entirely dependent. We are entirely dependent on um, bacteria. Uh, somebody's waving at me, sorry. We are entirely dependent on nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. Um, the nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it to a, a chemical called nitrate, which plants can use. So it's just a wacky idea that our entire environment is dependent on bacteria, that life can't exist without these bacteria pulling nitrogen from the atmosphere. And strangely enough, we have bacteria that do the opposite process. They take nitrogen that's in the soil and return it back to the atmosphere to complete that cycle. When plants and animals decompose, they're full of nitrogen also. That nitrogen gets returned to the soil during that um, decomposition process. They call it ammonification when we're talking about the nitrogen specifically. And then those other bacteria um, in a process called denitrification return the, the um, nitrogen back to the atmosphere. Here's a picture of that cycle. It says up in the upper left-hand corner, this is what I really need you to know. The nitrogen cycle depends on bacteria. So there's two things that I want you to know about the cycle. On the left that I just circled, nitrogen fixing bacteria. They're typically found in the roots of plants called legumes, like beans and peas. They pull the nitrogen out of the sky and put it into the soil. And then the opposite on the other side of the diagram are the denitrifying bacteria. They're the ones that take the nitrogen that's in the soil from dead stuff and they put it back into the atmosphere. And that's our cycle. So you need to know that the nitrogen cycle is entirely dependent on bacteria. All right, and then the last cycle we have is the phosphorus cycle. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the phosphorus cycle, except the part of the phosphorus cycle that is very out of balance right now, and that has to do with fertilizers. The phosphorus cycle is important because we need phosphorus for ATP, we need it for DNA, and we need it for our bones and cell membranes. Sounds kind of important to me. Phosphorus is an important limiting factor. We're gonna learn about that in just a little bit. An important limiting factor in the growth of most producers. What that means is if you run out of something, then the thing can't grow anymore. So if you run out of phosphorus, then these plants can't grow anymore. So it's really important. We use phosphorus for farms, we use phosphorus in yards, all kinds of things. Phosphorus is used in fertilizers to help our lawns and our crops and gardens grow. This is where we have trouble. It's called eutrophication, big ugly word. Eutrophication refers to an imbalance in the phosphorus cycle. Most lakes, they're supposed to be this way, most lakes don't have much phosphorus. That keeps plants from taking over, so plants are supposed to be clear. The pictures in um, on this screen are showing you lakes that are high in phosphorus. However, rain can wash fertilizers from lakes and streams. The addition of fertilizers causes excess plants to grow, and that eventually leads to the death of fish, and that whole process is called eutrophication.
plants growing, fish dying, eutrophication. Phosphorus is now banned in commercial fertilizers in Minnesota to help prevent this process of eutrophication. All right, I've only got a few seconds left, so I'll have to sign off. Have a great day.